Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this 2023 ECOSOC Partnership Forum side event. This 90-minute side event will discuss recent innovative partnerships that are driving action on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, at the local level, and highlight the contributions that transnational multi-stakeholder partnerships can make in this regard, as well as the challenges involved. A key theme will be how transnational partnerships such as these can leverage interlinkages between SDGs at the local level to empower communities to improve local SDG implementation. This session has been organized by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future. And I would like to thank ECOSOC and the Partnership Forum Secretariat for making it possible. I'm Charles Newhan, Chairman of Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future and your host and moderator today from New York. I am joined by a distinguished panel of speakers, one of whom is my colleague, Dr. David Horan, Assistant Professor at Trinity Business School, Trinity College, Dublin, and advisor on SDG partnerships and governance for the SDGs at Stakeholder Forum. David is joining us today from Ireland. Now, as you can see from our, your screen, we have a panel of special guests who, with a diverse range of experiences and knowledge, I will introduce in the coming minutes. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the Stakeholder Forum, it is an international not-for-profit NGO in consultative status with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, commonly known as ECOSOC, since 1996. SF has, for more than 25 years, been working to advance sustainable development at all levels. We seek to provide a bridge between those who have a stake in sustainable development and the international forums where decisions are made in their name. Now, before I hand the floor over to our first speaker, there is a bit of housekeeping to attend to. Uh, please note that the uh, webinar is being live streamed on YouTube and a link to the recording will be posted on the Stakeholder Forum website soon afterwards. And as you will see, attendee cameras and microphones are muted and will remain so throughout the webinar. But there will be an opportunity for questions from attendees after we hear from the panel, and those questions should be submitted to the Q&A section in the bottom of your screen, not to the chat section. The chat section is for you to communicate with each other, where you can post links to matters relevant to the webinar topic and share contact details with each other if you wish to. You are also welcome to scroll through the questions and upvote them. That is, vote for a question that you too would like to be addressed if you see it already in the Q&A section. That will help us to focus on questions that might be of interest to multiple attendees, and our panel will then be able to answer in the time that we have. Now, uh, apologies in advance for uh, not being able to answer any questions, or all questions, I should say, due to time restraints if we do run out of time. So now uh, let's begin uh, with introductory comments from uh, Jan Gustav Strandenes. Jan Gustav began working with the UN on environment and governance matters in the 1970s and has been lecturing about the United Nations for 50 years. He worked for NGOs at the United Nations in New York during the Commission on Sustainable Development years and has carried out multiple assignments for UNEP. Earlier, Jan Gustav worked as a diplomat for Norway's Foreign Office in Botswana and Uganda, and later uh, directed a large aid and environment NGO in Norway for two decades. His most recent achievement uh, was as project manager for Towards Stockholm Plus 50, a joint initiative by Stakeholder Forum for Sustainable Future and the Norwegian Forum for Development and Environment. Uh, Jan Gustav, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, Charles, for introducing me. After this year, the high-level political forum 187 of the UN's 193 member states will have given at least one national report, a voluntary national review, a VNR. But by this HLPF in July, more than 300 VNRs will have been delivered and debated, proof that nearly every country in the world has adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as a key element in the national development plans. Proof also that implementation is taking place. But are we on track? SDG 17 is in everyday vernacular referred to as the partnership goal, but it is also about finance, technology, capacity building, trade and systemic issues such as data, monitoring and accountability, as well as precisely 
multi-stakeholder partnerships. The 2030 Agenda document introduces the fundamentals of the partnership model already in its introductory chapter. Two paragraphs are key. Paragraph 39 makes us aware that, and I quote, the scale and ambition of the new agenda requires a revitalized global partnership to ensure its implementation. And paragraph 40 includes all 17 SDGs in the world of partnerships by informing us that, and I quote, the means of implementation targets under goal 17 and under each sustainable development goal are key to realizing our agenda and are of equal importance with the other goals and targets. As the concept of the 2030 Agenda has been integrated in national development plans in nearly every country in the world, so has the implementation model of partnerships. This side event tries to shed light on how to leverage interlinkages among the SDGs through inclusive partnerships with local communities. It is therefore well to remind us of some of the backgrounds for the partnerships. Partnerships as constructs for implementation have been around for quite a while. The oldest partnership registered is reported to have been the construction of the Canal de Briard in France, which was completed in 1642. The biggest partnership to date is apparently the New Deal project initiated by the U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s to bring the U.S. out of its depression. Presently, presented as, sorry, presented as a novelty to the intergovernmental community and the UN in 1997, the late Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Kofi Annan, introduced the idea of public-private partnerships as a way forward. Scholarships how, could, however, show that these constructs had been around for the better part of the 20th century. Its present format also has roots in the new public management theories, roots that have been fraught with criticism for being anti-democratic and also anti-civil society. What are partnerships and are they the panacea for implementing the 2030 Agenda? Following the Rio Plus 20 conference, the UN tried to establish a partnership facility and offered the following definition of partnerships. They are, it said, voluntary and collaborative relationships between various parties, both public and non-public, in which all participants agree to work together to achieve a common purpose or undertake a specific task and as mutually agreed to share risks and responsibilities, resources and benefits. A 2015 well-documented effort by academia holds that partnerships are and I quote, institutionalized transboundary interactions between public and private actors, which aim at the provision of collective goods. Similar efforts to define partnerships have followed. None have become universal, indicating substantive difficulties in creating and upholding an essential element of a functioning partnership, equality and parity among the partners. Reading through the 2030 Agenda document, three actors are identified. The governments or its representatives through ministries and directorates or local authorities, the private sector and civil society. Practice now embrace the concept of partnerships as a key element to create well-being for all and leaving no one behind. At the same time, the 17 SDGs include a host of technical issues that need expert understanding, planning, and implementation. In such contexts, maintaining parity and equality among the three actors in a partnership becomes a challenge. Take, for instance, SDG 9 on, and I quote, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. Target 9. Point four elucidates this by stating, by 2030, upgrade infrastructure and retrofit industries to make them sustainable with increased resource use efficiency and greater adoption of clean and environmentally sound technologies and industrial processes with all countries taking action in accordance with the respective capabilities. Authorities define the parameters and set the rules to implement the targets. 
the private sector with all its money and expertise will be invited to carry out the implementation, then what is the role of civil society and local communities? The traditional role for civil society is that of a watchdog. But how can you be an effective watchdog if you do not have the capacity to read advanced plans to develop infrastructure? Will government say, let the private sector do this? They have the money and the expertise. The local community will, after all, benefit from the development that they initiate. What if the new infrastructure violates the local environment? How does that interlink with SDG 14 and SDG 15, both known as the nature-focused SDGs? What if the retrofitting modernizes infrastructure to such an extent that people lose their jobs and income? How does that interlink with goal 8 on jobs and goal 10 on equality? And what if the local community needs time to understand what upgrading infrastructure and retrofitting industry means, and the private sector investor eager to implement leave because they feel they are losing market opportunities? And bringing the in the SDGs indicators will further complicate the picture as monitoring and analysis of project may be a complex procedure that may further constrain the implementation and even alienate civil society. <clears throat> because of the interlinked nature of all SDGs, similar questions can and should be asked in every project that relates to each and every SDG. The SDGs have brought the world forward in terms of transformative change. What was once a theory embedded in the 1987 UN report, Our Common Future, or known as the Brundtland Report, has today become the basis for national development. But with this comes complexity and interlinkages and the need to understand the new challenges posed by technical and other complex elements that are implicit in all of the SDGs. The necessity to understand this and have the relevant and adequate knowledge for all involved is often ignored when a project is designed and implementation is commenced. This represents an underestimated challenge for local communities and civil society. Civil society does not have to become engineers or professors, but its membership must be able to understand all elements of an SDG project and their effects and consequences on society. How else can they be relevant in their traditional and important role being watchdogs on behalf of communities? Combining the strengths of the private sector, public sector, and civil society, multi-stakeholder partnerships can be more than the sum of their parts. Leveraging multi-stakeholder partnerships can be used to enhance integrity and reduce corruption in projects. Several studies can corroborate this. And this leads me to a final issue on inclusive partnerships and local communities, an issue that I believe will serve as a guarantor to successful partnerships where parity among the involved parties may be upheld, namely basing all partnerships on properly developed and understood good governance, and all that implies with proper participation, transparency, accountability, and proper access. This will be a key challenge, not only today, but for the remaining years until 2030 and beyond. Thank you for your attention. Uh, young Gustav, thank you so very much for setting the scene so thoroughly. Um, now, we'll now uh, move on to our expert panel, to whom I would like to remind that each of you have up to 10 minutes to address us. This uh, should ensure that we have adequate time afterwards to address questions from our audience. So please now welcome uh, Katarina Wim, uh, who is in her last year of working on a PhD at the University of Technology in Sydney, uh, and is the global head of sustainability for Al Alimia, Alima. Please forgive me, uh, Katerina, for butchering that. A company manufacturing steel alloys for extreme environments. Her professional background has been with government and civil society organizations with a focus on stakeholder dialogue to address environmental changes, and which, of course, uh, makes her very suited to uh, today's dialogue. Katerina, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And also, um, as I get this presentation up, um, thank you very much to Jan Gustav. Uh, lovely uh, introduction. And, uh, and my work 
we'll touch on many of these points. Sorry. And um, sorry, there's a not, there we go. Um, I also want to express gratitude to Stakeholder Forum that I have the opportunity to speak about my dissertation at, at this event. My research has been made possible thanks to the Decent Work and Garment Sector Supply Chains in Asia project, which is implemented by the ILO and funded by the Swedish International Cooperation Agency. When looking at multi-stakeholder partnerships in the Bangladeshi textile industry, there are numerous and complex issues at play. In my work, I investigate how these often competing interests have been dealt with. A lot of governments in Asia have used the textile industry as a way to provide opportunities for the large number of unskilled laborers and thereby building robust economies in developing countries. The textile industry, however, causes significant environmental degradation and governments will have to fund that remediation. Multi-stakeholder par partnerships funded by international aid organizations have been actively engaging in Bangladesh and I should also add many other Asian countries to address these challenges. Much of the focus has been on capacity building of manufacturers, of technical staff, of workers, local consultants to the industry. But building robust economies, is that really what is being done? This picture is from a town of Burås, where the Swedish textile industry had its hub. Um, late 1800s, the Swedish textile industry was small. Overall, all in all, approximately 70,000 workers with a population of 7 million when the industry was growing and at a 7 million at a century later when it was being dismantled. In Bangladesh, the garment industry emerged in the 1980s, growing out of the jute manufacturing tra tradition. Bangladesh has a population of 166 million people on a land area that is one third the size of Sweden. So we have 4.5 million people working in this industry, which contribute to 11% of the GDP and 80% of Bangladeshi exports. No small feat, as you understand. But with this, I'm trying to illustrate the difference in size and what with the difference in size comes difference in impact. The industry provides jobs, yes, but the environmental debt that it is causing is enormous. So when you look at the picture of the Swedish river, rather idyllic, wouldn't you say? But it does not reveal the fact that even today it is prohibited to swim in Viscan River because of the industrial waste that is sedimented on the riverbed. A pre-study that is underway costing $3.5 billion has estimated that the cost of remediation will be at least $100 billion. Now, this is the environmental cost for government today to clean up after an industry that employed approximately 70,000 people. What will be the cost in Bangladesh as the so-called robust economy is being built? Today, that is not a question that is being asked. Negative envi um, environmental impacts from textile in industry are many. Effluents of chemicals and dyes polluting the water, affecting directly the communities that use the river for household purposes, to grow vegetables, and for animals to drink. The effluents are also polluting the groundwater, and during floods, as happened last year, everything is washed out to, into the ocean. Climate change effects in Bangladesh are projected to severely impact all sectors as the sea level rises and extreme rains increase. The pressure on women, children, and the poor in the communities is disproportionate. The industry has emerged quickly, but it might not be able to sustain its workforce as it is rapidly being mechanized. But also as Women, children, and the poor depend on a livelihood along the polluted riverbeds, and that is also limiting their existence. 
Numerous multi-stakeholder partnerships working in the textile sector have been active in Bangladesh. And in my research, I look at Sweden Textile Water Initiative, funded by the Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, Better Mills Initiative, funded by the Dutch Development Corporation, and Partnership for Cleaner Textile, funded by IFC. These partnerships all bring together international brands, manufacturers, civil society organizations, workers, technical consultants, uh, regulators, and business associations. So true partnerships. And I have to say that the impact, the positive impact of these partnerships cannot be denied. There was no sustainability conversation in the textile sector when these initiatives emerged maybe 15 years ago, give or take, 10, 10 to 15 years ago. And the capacity building work that they have done is really instrumental in, in the transformation. Implementing environmental management systems to monitor resource use, um, ensure that regulations are in place and enforced, which is not entirely happening uh, to the extent that is, that is desirable. Um, addressing environmental consequences in the communities where the workers live, reducing CO2 emissions, a wide variety of technical and process improvements through technical advisory services while building the capacity of local technical consultants. Now, I'm currently summarizing and trying to evaluate the issues, the impacts of the, oh, sorry, the, the issues and the impacts of these partnerships. And they undoubtedly support delivery of Agenda 2030. It's in the undeniable. The cross-sectoral dialogue and collaboration has helped to increase sustainability in the Bangladeshi garment sector. There are many, many brands, international brands that engage in dialogue regarding the environmental debt that is growing in Bangladesh. Yet, these brands are not willing to discuss or change the business models and the growth paradigm that has generated the environmental burdens of Bangladesh. The international brands are those with access to initiatives like UN Alliance for Sustainable Fashion, but it's not the manufacturers, not the local manufacturers in Bangladesh. There's a representational mismatch and there is a risk for greenwashing. Another issue is evaluation. How are the multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships evaluated? Against what criteria? Do they uphold the standards in the U UN Charter? Are they transparent? The environmental, oh, also who has the mandate to evaluate and what is being evaluated? The environmental debt is undeniable and the planetary boundaries are being transgressed at and the resilience of life-sustaining biosphere is increasingly compromised. The word resilience is used in so many different ways, but it really originates with, with relationship to the biosphere. The biosphere has supported and sustained the development of civilizations, and we, but we can no longer take it for granted. Although the multi-stakeholder partnerships have incre increased and improved sustainability in the industry, the environmental consequences are not addressed. They're not re remedied. And since the initiatives are funded with public funds, the question of accountability and evaluation really becomes a crucial point. In conclusion, the multi-stakeholder partnerships in Bangladesh provide an example of the complex, multifaceted, unforeseeable consequences of unintentional effects that are caused by an unmanaged interweaving of human actions and environmental changes. Multi-stakeholder partnerships are instrumental, but environmental consequences need to be part of how we assess the robustness of projects, as Jan Gustav said, but also of economies. And the growth paradigm has to be replaced by economies that are regenerative by design. Thank you very much for your attention. Katarina, thank you so very much for that. Uh, and in particular, 
reminding us how the contrast between the uh, developed world and the developing world when it comes to environmental matters, but also reminding us that even in the developed world, there is the legacy of pollution. Uh, I, I live in the New York area where there are the greatest number of what are known as Superfund sites in the United States, uh, waterways and land polluted by years of industrial growth and carelessness and disregard for the environment. So uh, seeing what you've presented to us uh, is a reminder that we still make those mistakes and, it, and shame on us for doing so. Uh, let's now uh, move on to our next speaker, uh, Demetria Exodos uh, is a research fellow at Trinity College Dublin and co-principal investigator of the Horizon Europe H2020 funded Connecting Nature, a project on the implementation of nature-based solutions. Uh, you now have the floor and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here with everyone uh, today or this evening because it's uh, almost 7 p.m. here in Ireland. Um, I'll just get my slides ready to go. Great. So um, I'm going to be speaking to you about the work um, that we did as part of the Connecting Nature project and looking specifically at how we engaged with local communities in the planning, delivery and stewardship of nature-based solutions and linking that back to the SDGs. So a little bit about the project. So Connecting Nature was a Horizon 2020 project that ran from 2017 to 2022. And it was a consortium composed of around 30 plus organizations um, representing uh, cities and municipalities, um, small businesses, uh, NGOs, academics and researchers. And all of us worked together in new ways to bring nature into cities and working together with citizens for the local economy by implementing nature based solutions. Um, my specific role on the project was in supporting a number of cities in the scaling out of nature-based solutions. And I would have to say that one of the real joys of the project was in seeing how over the course of the project, the boundaries between work packages really dissolved and the whole consortium just um, came together in true collaborative manner to support the cities in the implementation of nature-based solutions. It's been a real, it's left a real impression on me and it has impacted and influenced the way that I work um, with colleagues and partners and other projects because it was really quite special. So I hope I can convey some of that over to you today. Um, so to start off with, um, just to say that the European Commission defines nature-based solutions to societal change as solutions that are inspired and supported by nature, which are cost-effective, simultaneously providing environmental, social, and economic benefits, and help build resilience. Such solutions bring more diverse nature and natural features and processes into cities, landscapes, and seascapes through locally adapted, resource-efficient, and syst systemic interventions. So it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so for the Connecting Nature project, um, our cities undertook um, a strategic mapping exercise to align the nature-based exemplars that they would be implementing throughout the project with key city priorities, uh, regional priorities, national priorities, European-based uh, solutions frameworks, all the way up to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So here you'll see, um, showing you a photo of the urban gardens in A Coronia, that was the exemplar there. And the aim of the, uh, of the exemplar was to connect all of the urban gardens together and to provide multiple environmental, economic, and social benefits um, while improving biodiversity and resilience against climate change. And at the same time, also promoting sustainable and active lifestyles for the residents in A Coronia. Um, as you will see, as part of the exercise in doing this strategic alignment, they also looked at a number of key uh, UN sustainable development goals that um, the nature-based solution would be also addressing. And so they're here, there's, there's, there's a lot there, including good health and well-being, um, uh, sustainable cities and communities, as well as partnerships for uh, supporting implementation. Um, 
In addition, as part of the project, um, the planning, delivery and stewardship of nature-based solutions is quite complex. And so for the project, we worked with our cities to co-develop and test a framework that aimed at supporting them towards a large scale implementation of their nature-based solutions. Um, you'll see that this is the framework um, on the screen. Um, and the cities themselves have reflected on the capacity of the framework to help them um, break down silos and work inter and cross departmentally with a wide variety of stakeholders stakeholders and partners. So again, in A Coronia, um, they reflected on the, the Connecting Nature framework and the report um, as useful tools for internal use to make sure that other colleagues were familiar with the concept of nature-based solutions, um, which can be quite a new word in, uh, in, in, in most contexts, but uh, especially when you're trying to translate and explain it in uh, non-English speaking environments, there could be additional barriers there. Um, it also helped them to advance uh, the interdepartmental and integrated approach that the multifunctional aspect of nature based solutions demand. And you'll see here there are three phases to the um, to nature based solutions planning delivery, delivery and stewardship. And within each phase, there are a number of different elements from technical solutions, governance, finance and business models, nature based enterprises, co production and reflexive monitoring. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go through everything today. But if you go to the connecting nature website, you can learn more about this framework. Uh, I am going to focus in on one of the elements and that is of co-production. So co-production was central for supporting the implementation of nature-based solution in each of the cities. And over the course of the five-year project, we worked um, on the development and the refinement of a set of principles on what, um, what would constitute a good co-production process. So in our view, a good co-production process is inclusive. It brings all the different diverse actors together on an equal stage to share their knowledge uh, and to create new knowledge. It's open to two new types of knowledge and actors. It's legitimate, so it's a process that is trusted. Um, and the outcomes themselves are uh, should be actionable. They should be empowering for participants and they should be aligning by breaking down uh, silos and connecting different agendas. Um, I'm going to now go and speak a little bit about some of the key innovations um, that came out of co-production for the project. I'm going to focus in on two. So the first one was the business model canvas. Now, this was initially part of the element around financing. However, it is designed as a co-production tool, as an effective way to bring partners together to reflect on the financing, as well as the co-governance of nature-based solution across the three phases. Governance is a new uh, addition to the canvas, and this reflects the importance of identifying early on how the solution will be managed and also on an ongoing operational basis. So as we've said, nature-based solutions require the involvement of many different partners and beneficiaries, and it's important to consider early on in the plan planning process how different stakeholders will be engaged in the ongoing management as well as the operations and what governance structures need to facilitate this. And you'll see here one of our uh, cities in Glasgow, uh, you know, speaking about their um, experience of the nature of, of the business model canvas and praising it as one of the best community consultations they've ever been involved with. Um, Another one of our cities, uh, Malaga, saw that the, the business model canvas was a useful tool to explain nature-based solutions, as well as a way to really think about the connecting nature methodology and uh, what would be a good path to follow. It shows them how to engage um, nature-based solutions through entrepreneurship, partnership, and governance, and how to look for financing for their nature-based uh, projects. The next uh, co-production um, innovation that I just want to touch on here is the Sarajevo pathway. So even by the by virtue of its name, just to show how co-productive co it is, this was first uh, tried and tested in Sarajevo, which is another one of our cities, in March 2020. And so uh, we've given a uh, it the name of the city in which it was tested in. And this is a co-creative arts-based engagement process designed to establish or re-establish connections with nature within cities. It aims to revitalize those connections to nature and it provides a useful tool for engagement. And it does this by inviting creative encounters with the past, present and future. And we do this using the methods of memory work, 
body mapping, embodied reflection, and immersion in nature. And in this way, we create an imaginative space for people to really connect with their emotional uh, feelings about nature, and it helps with um, innovative storytelling for participants themselves. Um, and you'll see here, this is in A Coronia again with the urban gardeners. Um, we were very lucky that we were able to run this workshop in person in the middle of the pandemic. You'll see everybody's got their masks on, but um, it was viewed as a really really a valuable experience and really meaningful for the participants. And it links, um, they saw that it linked directly with impacts of the nature-based solutions on health and well-being because it allowed participants to really reflect and think about how they feel when they are in nature, which is usually a very positive um, uh, feeling of well-being and of happiness. And I can't stress enough how important that was, especially given the last two years and the restrictions that everyone had been under due to COVID. Um, so it's really wonderful to see um, uh, this, this coming out of A Coronia. Um, in terms of key lessons and insights, uh, just to, to hit on a couple here, um, for us and as part of the project, we, you know, we recognize that inclusive partnerships developed through co-creation are key to nature-based solutions, which address an, a multiple um, SDGs. Um, inclusive partnerships are essential not just for the planning of nature-based solution, but also for the long-term stewardship of nature-based solutions. Time and resources need to be invested in building inclusive partnerships that people want to be involved in and feel um, connected to in the long term. And uh, finally, also just to say, it's really important to value people's time and input in, in co-production processes and in fostering these relationships and these partnerships. Um, it's not just a nice thing to have uh, co-creation as part of um, these types of processes. It really is important to really think about what's coming Coming from them and to 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 really uh, honor and respect it. And so, with that in mind, I just wanted to share this last slide from um, the exhibition that we were able to hold in A Coronia in November of 2021, where not only was this exhibition used as a way of communicating uh, nature-based solutions in, uh, in A Coronia and to share it with a number of stakeholders for the council, but it was also about um, the participants themselves seeing their input and their lived experiences and their histories showcased as part of the exhibition. Here, this is their memory work with their texts and their photographs. And this was showcased alongside professional artists that we had invited to um, follow along with the urban gardeners and respond to what was coming. So you have an illustration here at the bottom right, as well as a, uh, we had a poet. And so the poetic response and the memory works were also included in, 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 the, in the materials that were, uh, came out of that process. So I just wanna say thank you very much for listening. Demetria, thank you uh, ever so much. Uh, and especially for um, bringing to our attention, the success of partnerships you know, as they exist today. Uh, young Gustav will, will uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but back at the Earth Summit in 2002, there was a partnerships um, conference, I believe, a side conference, uh, where there was the development of type one and type two partnerships. So I think that time, some 20 years ago, uh, is where these uh, the idea of these partnerships uh, might have been originally uh, conceived. So thank you very much for showing us what's happening today and how much progress has been made with partnerships. Now, on uh, please to our next speaker, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Thomas uh, Rebermark, who is director of Swedish Waterhouse, which works to enable multi-stakeholder partnerships between private and public sectors, academia, and international policy actors. Thomas's previous affiliations include Water Aid and Child Fund International, with work focusing on urban development, infrastructure, and civil engineering. He chairs the election board of the UN Global Compact Network in Sweden, holds diploma in executive management from the IFL Stockholm School of Economics and, and for service management from KTH Executive School, uh, Climate Ambition Accelerator Certificate from the UN Global Compact, and is a market economist associate degree uh, by DRMI in Bergs. Uh, Thomas, uh, you have the floor and please uh, feel free to share your presentation with us. Thomas, are you with us? 
We can't hear you. I am with you, Charles. Okay. I'm sorry. Oh, you are, my Charlie. screens are uh, mixing my uh, things up at the moment. So I will just try to. Oh, that's okay. Take take your time. We're, we're good. Arranged it. Thank you for that very long and thorough introduction. Um, I'm uh, very happy to meet you all. And uh, uh, it's a privilege for me and CV to be in this, um, given this opportunity. I will just try to get my presentation up and running. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can now. Just bring it to full and we're all ready to go. Yes, I think I have a dual problem here with my screen. So I might have to uh, do like this. And just on the bottom right hand side is the little, little, uh, yep, right there. That should do the trick. That should do the trick. Um, yes, it looks uh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, um, in less than a decade, the world uh, needs to urgently slash the carbon emissions, uh, reverse the environmental de degradation and achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. With lack of progress, it is uh, clear that a new and more holistic action and co-creating approach is, um, sorry, did it jump out again? Yes, it, it has. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see I mean, if I can, my screen is sorry, a little bit fussy. Um, sorry for that. Hang on. Patience is of uh, the essence, isn't that said? So, so I'm just trying to uh, get everything on board here. Uh, sorry for this mismatch. And I will stop sharing and come back to you in just a second. Here we go. And let's see if I can get this to work now. Thomas, if you uh, are able to send it to me uh, by email, I would be happy to project it. I don't think you sent it to me earlier. No, I haven't sent it. And uh, I'm trying again now and see if this... Oh, you're works. getting there. Looks good. We're getting there. Yep. It's fully taken over. Um, anyhow, um, I will skip my manuscript. That disappears every time I do this. So uh, we can only achieve the sustainable amendment goals um, if we understand how each goal is interlinked, interdependent, and instrumental for a planet with a healthy people and ecosystems. Fresh water is an instrumental connector between the different SDGs and a good starting point for solutions that increase the resilience of both people and the planet to raise awareness of the water dimensions of all the SDG targets, as well as those of climate mitigation and adaptation is key to unlock the agenda 2030. And to us, water is key because if you don't have water, you have very difficult to achieve uh, any other of uh, many of the other uh, goals around you. You cannot fight poverty, you cannot fight uh, hunger, you cannot fight the, the, a, a whole range of the other targets. Um, and our method of doing this is uh, working with what we call water governance, um, and we divide this into three uh, 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 sort of blocks, uh, into function, attributes, and outcomes. And when it comes to outcomes, it's always about enabling conditions, changing behavioral um, uh, environments, and changing social environments and conditions, and sustainability and, and resilience uh, of changes achieved. So that's how we, we work on this. And the model we work with is the multi-stakeholder partnership concept. Um, and this is our own um, uh, way of interpreting that. So we always end up, start with um, raising awareness and identify stakeholders with links uh, at community or local or regional global level. Uh, we build coalitions out of, uh, the, uh, of these um, uh, stakeholder uh, meetings. And we start up incubator, uh, or, or you could call it cluster groups uh, that are active in two, three years, and then hopefully uh, ends up in some partnerships. It doesn't have to be with us. It can be with us. 
but between others, uh, or it can be in programs. And so far we have seen that in, in food and water, apparel and water, pharma and water, uh, we have forest and water, and, and of course uh, the prelude and, and, and onto the landscape aspects from the forestation uh, aspect. Uh, we have uh, also into energy and, and finance and water and biodiversity. Um, and, and later on, this became, becomes sort of the policy that we recommend also on a, on a local or regional or global level. Um, and part of this team working at Swedish Water House is also involved in the international processes and the, and the policy making. Um, and, and then uh, the aim is to um, underpin and create uh, trust that can uh, um, lead to collective action. To give you uh, some example, and this is from two angles. Uh, the first one is a report we launched at uh, the uh, COP, the climate conference in November um, in Sharm el Sheikh. Uh, it's called the, the Essential Drop to Net Zero. Uh, it's it's um, it's a study or a com, com, uh, compromising uh, study of of all mitigation study that, that has been globally uh, involving about two thousand uh, scientists on on mitigation um, aspects towards uh, water and climate um, and the key finding is in this um, has led to uh, the, the, the climate mitigation measures is dependent on water resources we know that climate mitigation measures is impacting on fresh water water and sanitation management can reduce GAG uh, global emissions and nature-based solutions to mitigate climate can deliver multiple benefits for people and the environment, as we heard uh, Dimitri say, uh, say just before me. Um, and, and joint water and climate governance need to be coordinated and strengthened. And this connects to uh, a lot of the um, uh, SDGs involved. And what we do with this uh, overarching sort of um, uh, study is that we then bring it uh, bring it down and break it down to blocks and into activities uh, according to the model I just uh, showed you prehand or, or beforehand. And and from the other perspective, we have a forest and landscape um, project uh, and or several of them. And um, what we do there is that we bring this model, and when it comes down to to uh, the smallholders, the communities, and the local entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that must become active agents of change in the forest uh, restoration process or in, and in the landscaping process. Um, we look, uh, we have dialogues with them. We are, I have colleagues right now in, in Togo and Burkina Faso and Ethiopia uh, doing workshops with local communities and, and stakeholders uh, on how to scale up on restoration on forest or landscape. Uh, while at the same time securing prosper uh, prosperity of local communities, how to maintain and improve ecosystem services, um, such as provision of clean water and biodiversity and, and regulation of climate. Um, and, and we do this uh, by setting up programs with, with large scale restoration of, of degraded natural forests um, that later on can deliver new and substantial income uh, opportunities and improve livelihoods for the people living in around the landscape or in the forest. And uh, this is almost uh, 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 temporary pictures uh, from, from um, what's happening now. Um, we work with different tools and how you use the components of a web course. Um, uh, we use midterm workshops, we have change projects to, to uh, and, and then we work with final workshops and then we also not drop the project stuff there but we keep on with the alumni um, over years to make sure that the, the behavioral change and the, and the support to the, the ones involved are there for, for a longer period than just a normal program. Uh, and we do this in, in Ethiopia. We, we uh, have a source, a project called Source Protection in Africa. We have a case study in Somalia on flood risk management. Um, we have publications, as I just uh, showed you. We have multi stakeholder uh, partnership platforms that uh, we call Forest Water Champions, that are the alumni and, and uh, the long term sort of support for that. 
We work with water biodiversity and finance, with Swedish stakeholders and groundwater groups, uh, also with Swedish stakeholders. We had a, a seminar last uh, Monday with over 200 participants looking into the draft and, and flooding aspect that is also now affecting the Swedish uh, landscape. Um, and we do training and capacity building together with SIDA. Uh, we work with FAO uh, on restoration uh, and uh, we have e-learning courses that you can easily access or get access to um, uh, through these um, centers that we uh, are working through uh, on community and local level. And I think uh, Katarina went through this uh, STWI project. Uh, it's also been housed uh, in Swedish Water House. I'm sorry for <laughs> duplicating Katarina, uh, but I just wanted to show you the outcomes um, which started with a, with a textile water initiative, but ended up with, with a multiple sort of uh, uh, gains and, and uh, wins in terms of, of less chemical use, electrical use, um, and we had about 37,000 tra workers trained through awareness on, on how to, to um, uh, adopt, but also mitigate um, uh, and, and secure that we use less resources when doing textiles, even if the textile industry has a long way far, uh, to go still to be um, sustainable. Uh, it is a step forward, and, and that's how we can be of uh, supporting the water governance model we're working with. So thank you for listening. Um, I will hand over to Charles again and sorry for the disturbance in the beginning. Um, I will practice more next time and make sure everything works together technically. Thomas, uh, thank you for such an impressive resume of work that the organization has been doing. Um, and also the fact that you and Demetria uh, have been collaborating on one of the projects just shows how effective uh, partnerships are in bringing together different organizations from different parts of the world to make a difference um, globally uh, around sustainability. Now, what I would ask you also, uh, Thomas, if you could stop sharing your screen. Um, yes. And, be, yeah, sure. and while you're working on that, oh, that's good. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I'm now going to bring in uh, our next speaker. Um, and uh, so thank you, Thomas, for that. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Raymond Sanner, uh, titular professor in economics at the Department of, uh, pardon me, at the Department of Economics at the University of Basel. Uh, his research projects focus on sustainable development, international relations, trade, and public administration. Professor Sanner is a co-founder of uh, CSEND, uh, which is the Center for Socioeconomic uh, development uh, and uh, is an organization that is long time accredited with uh, ECOSOC with consultative status. Uh, he's an expert in working for international organizations, national governments, and civil society organizations, uh, and a scholar in the field of international negotiations and conflict resolution. He often works for UNDESA on projects related to the 2030 Agenda and the 17 SDGs. Uh, Raymond, you have the floor and please uh, share, oh, you've got your screen up, that's great. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Charles, for the introduction. Hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to be, to be with you. And uh, you, uh, you already see what the uh, title is that I got to talk about for, during the seven minutes that have been uh, allotted to me. and. The long title, let's just focus on at the end of, of the long title. It's about implementation and the interlinkages between the different goals. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, of course, we're now midway through to the 2030 agenda's final destination, which is 2030. Uh, some countries have been able to move ahead very well and are implementing the SDGs. Others had difficulties uh, with it and are also catching up. But at the same time, I'd like to say, of course, we all in most of our countries up to 2030, probably we will have several governments that come in and others will leave. So there will be needs to reassess how to implement, maybe to give different focus or different priorities. So the implementation, the planning for it and the execution of implementation of the, of the SDGs hold all the way up to 2030. Now, what you see here 
is um, uh, the uh, probably a slide that you have seen already, and that is um, which which shows the interconnections. Let me make it larger, maybe. Then you have the full. Yeah, I think that's better. Uh, that you see the different goals and how they interrelate with each other. They're interdependent. But just to make it more um, uh, explicit, here you got in the middle one of the goals, which is to reduce inequality. The size of the circle shows the strength of this particular goal and how it relates to other goals. And some of the other goals that are very much also uh, large, uh, such as the impact of inequality on health, the impact of inequality on hunger, uh, food. Uh, this is just an illustration to think through when planning for implementation, how do the different goals link with each other? And what's most important, of course, for the country, that's for the country to define. Now, <clears throat> how to get from A to B, meaning from a non-sustainable current stage to a more sustainable future. Here, basically, system theory, which I, I have been applying for over the last uh, more than 20 years when doing system change or reforms, basically, we have to define as a group, it's a collective task for each country, it's actually also for munis municipalities or regions that want to implement the SDGs, is to define where are we now? What's going well? What's not going so well? What are our what are our needs that the uh, SDGs could help us to overcome and hence where we need inputs in order to transform the current situation that we have at hand. Then comes the whole process of moving from one state to the other state, the other state being the future state. And some of the things I will be showing to you pertains to this throughput change process, which holds, whether it's a, you know, a transformation you, you plan to do in an organization, in a company, enterprise, or in a municipality, or also at the larger scale of a country. So give you an example of Switzerland, the country I live in, and I'm Swiss myself, when the Swiss government started with its own journey towards implementation of the SDGs, it had discussions within parliament, within the government, to come up with principles. What are the principles based on which Switzerland wants to implement the SDGs? What are the core objectives? In other words, the targets of the goals that are very important for Switzerland. And then they decided to focus on four of the 17 goals, particularly water health, gender equality, peace, and inclusive societies, and how to do it why uh, these the focus on these targets? It's partially to reduce uh, the risk of cat uh, uh, catastrophes and to focus on what to do with migration, development, and particularly sustainable consumption. Because Switzerland, like Singapore, we import most of the food, which in other words, increases the footprint because some of the production of the, um, the food that we consume is not very much uh, environmentally friendly. So we have at the end, the focus on the three dimensionalities, the three bottom, bottom lines. SDGs means economic, environmental, and social sustainability. We're looking at the financing for it and how to monitor in a continuous manner whether we are on target and what else needs to be changed if this is not the case. A key concept. We have 17 goals and all these targets. Well, some of the things, if we focus on, for instance, of uh, uh, focusing on, on reducing hunger, and we want to do this by use of more pesticides to increase the crop production, well, increased pesticide will have a negative impact on the environment. So that's more like a trade-off. We do one thing, which on the other hand, has maybe uh, negative consequences on another goal. Synergy will be to do something which is also beneficial for another goal. 
for instance, we had heard we heard uh, examples from from my colleagues just before when it comes to water, to purify the industrial water rather than just to let out into our rivers uh, chemically treated water, to uh, purify and to stop wasteful industrial waters to be let in or let out to, to our rivers means also that we help generate improvements of the health conditions of the population, particularly the population which lives close to the rivers. Now here you see a chart which I highly recommend to you and it's freely available. That's the one, a chart on which you find on pay, page six of the uh, Global Sustainable Development Report which was based on 20 researchers around the world, looking at all the research that was available at that time when they were uh, working on it, to find out what are the trade-offs and what are the synergistic impacts by working on the different goals. On the left side, vertically, here you see the goals, and horizontally, again, the goals, but you have to read it from left to the right. In other words, how do uh, these goals impact the other goals? For instance, if we go down to uh, more <clears throat> sustainable consumption, to be less wasteful, to be more mindful about how we live our lives, it could have a very beneficial impact, for instance, how we treat water, uh, whether we are wasteful or whether we are very concerned about how uh, the water quality is and how much water quality is available for others. Wherever you see uh, a part of that's in orange, like here, for instance, in uh, this goal impacting uh, um, life under the water, uh, the oceans, um, climate change. If we, uh, if we increase CO2 emissions, our oceans become acidic. More acidity means less fish or the impact on the oceans are negative. So that's how you need to read it and it's important because when you then do, when the country defines its uh, goals how to implement that is important to know what to do and what not to do or, or, or less to do in general when getting ready to implement the the government together with uh, its citizens there should be clear integration at the horizontal level that means particularly for instance between the ministries at the vertical integration level between the central government, the municipal government, the regional government, diagonally also meaning government and private sector and civil society, transversal meaning also beyond the country, the neighbors, especially if you share uh, waterways, how to uh, treat the waterways that are shared in a more sustainable manner. And interna international integration is basically all the places where our, our country has made commitments in regards to trade, health, or whatever the agreements were that were committed. Here, I'd like to show you what Finland has done with its voluntary national review in 2017. <clears throat> uh, I'm not gonna go this into detail, but it just gives you a very good overview how in Finland, they have organized the parliament, the government, what they all do about implementation of the SDGs. How do they report to the government, to the parliament? What is the time frame, as you see, first, second, third, fourth year, within which they have clear milestones how they want to implement their um, SDGs? So, in general, when we talk about horizontal coordination and integration, here at the top, you see, for instance, how the ministries should ideally work well together, coordinate and implement the SDGs, because the difficulty is that many of the SDGs affect or are impacted by different ministries or their ministries impact positively or neg ne negatively the implementation of different goals. So that's at the horizontal level. At the vertical level, there also should be good consultations between the government and the private sector, as well as between civil society. So the government is, uh, their, their plans are based on having asked and consulted with their citizens and with their private sector.
now how do i get yeah okay that's just to show how this functions here another one example from uh, again from switzerland here you see three ministries here you got in the middle the financial ministry here the political the foreign ministry and over here on the other side is the economics ministry they have been uh, among themselves assigned responsibilities for instance the economic ministry is in charge of the g20 and the oecd the financial ministry of g20 and the imf the foreign ministry of the un and its three 3g alliance so they're among themselves they know who should talk to whom and who has the lead sometimes as you can see here the two crosses means they shape they change every two years the other ministry takes the lead and the other one is supportive and down you see on the vertical side how these ministries are uh, planning and are asked to interact with the private sector and with civil society and you see here different names meaning they're just representing different organizations so in closing i'd say Whenever you are in your countries and whenever there is need for rethinking how to implement the SDGs, we should, of course, ask the question at home, <clears throat> which ministries should take the lead, which ministries could best uh, implement the SDGs and the priorities that have been set based on the needs of the country. And then to improve the credibility and the competence of the governments, the people in charge of implementing, they should also be competent in their field say about water about health about food about agriculture and then to design an interministerial uh, mechanism also a consultative mechanism and to keep on revisiting monitoring whether the current formula of this mechanism of doing all these forms of integration work well and if not then it should be changed and here you have a few uh, um, uh, a few sources for further study, if you're interested in that. that, that I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Let me also now quickly get out so my next colleague could take over. Raven, thank you so much. And in particular for uh, putting uh, so much of what is there in that plain language that those of us uh, not familiar with it can uh, easily understand. Um, now I'm going to uh, ask uh, Landre to uh, start his video uh, and his uh, microphone, and I'll, uh, I'd like to introduce him and then give him the floor. So uh, please now welcome Dr. Landry uh, uh, Bende, pardon me, Landry, if I didn't get that right, who's a medical doctor uh, and the public health specialist at the Kinshasa School of Public uh, Health, University of Kinshasa, capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he joins us from today. Uh, Dr. And, and, uh, Benge, Bende is now a project lead manager of the SDG CAP project, a collaboration between the uh, Karoninska Institute, uh, the Macri Ray School of Public Health, the Benadir University, and the Kinshasa uh, School of Public Health together building capacity for sustainable development goals in fragile states. Um, Landry, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to join this webinar and try to share with you our results. Uh, you know, uh, I'm part of uh, SDG CAP project, which is uh, uh, this project aimed to capacitate, uh, to bring capacity in, uh, for, uh, for achieving the SDG in fragile states. So our country is one of fragile states. So as you know, uh, the 2030 agenda explicitly acknowledged that uh, the SDGs are indivisible. So, but a systematic and contextualized assessment of uh, different interactions between SDG in the context of our country is lacking. So, we want to characterize and classify the linkages between SDG in the context of our country. So, for the projects, we organize a two days workshop, invited uh, different stakeholders. In total, we invited uh, 35 stakeholders, uh, try to they were proposedly selected according to their interest and in where, which sector or which goals they are contributed to the achievements according to the SDGs. So we invite seven people from academia, uh, one from private sectors, 
uh, four for civil society organizations and uh, six for international organizations and eight for uh, our government. So we try to get people of Ministry of Health, of Justice, of Agriculture, of Energy and the Ministry of Planning. Try to make all these stakeholders together, together thinking uh, on uh, the interaction between uh, SDG in our context. So uh, we use a SDG synergy tools, which was implemented in, by KI Carolisk Institute team. Uh, so the different stakeholders were divided into five groups. So they have to try to assess the interaction between each goals. We did not work in the target level, but we work on the goal level. So uh, if there is uh, a, is the goal can promote the achievement of another goal. So the interaction has a positive, uh, it shows a positive uh, interaction, but if the interaction between two goals, one goal restricted the achievement of another goal, so it was a negative interaction. So for this workshop, I would like to share with you the results that we found in uh, our context of DRC. So as you can see, uh, this matrix, this matrix tried to to help us to see in our context, which goals need to be prioritized by which goals, if we put many emphasis or many intervention in that goals, we could achieve uh, other, uh, other, all, all other goals. So in our context, it shows SDG 16, and we can see that the, 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 the total sum online uh, is 14, so meaning that if we put many intervention to achieve the SDG 16, which is peace, uh, justice, and uh, strong institutions, so we could achieve all the SDG in our context. Uh, you know that the country is facing a war in the east part of the in the east part, and we have many corruption and people. Our stakeholders thought that uh, the most important SDG, the most important goals, was SDG 16. So, as you can see. In this figure, so SDG 16 was perceived to be the most important in our context, and it was according to all stakeholders that we invited. So it could help the country to achieve all SDG, SDG 4, 3, 2, SDG 3, uh, 30, 11, and all other SDGs. So we need to work on this SDG if we want to attend to, to respond positively to the 2030 agenda. Uh, but as we are also in health sector, we want also secondary to see how health can promote other SDGs. So the most important SDG was SDG 16, but we try also to see how if we put many intervention to achieve the SDG 3, how it could promote uh, the achievement of other SDG. As we can see, this color is different than the color that we have seen in SDG, SDG 16 which is more strong. Uh, but here we can say that SDG3 in our context was also perceived to be important. It could help the country achieving other SDGs, uh, but it's not in the same level than SDG16. Uh, we can see that N was also, is also, this goal is also influenced by all, all the other SDGs, as we can see in this figure. So meaning that if we put intervention on uh, SDG 16, on SDG 4, on SDG 2, we could achieve SDG 3. Uh, in this network analysis, as you can see, there is not uh, a specific cluster. So meaning that in our context, we, we don't have a specific pool where we can put intervention. There is uh, a strong interactions between all SDGs. So as we can see that the SDG SDG are very interconnected. So, and we try to, as our results suggest, that there is many positive reactions, interaction between SDG. So we do not try to take to take each goals individually because they are very indivisible. And the most important SDG was SDG 16. If we want to prioritize, if we want to achieve the 2030 agenda, we need to make more intervention to, for achieving these goals, our country. But health was also perceived and first other SDGs. And 
as main recommendation that we addressed uh, for these results, uh, we thought that it's very important that different stakeholders work together. And we suggest to our government for the, our Minister of Planning to set up a sort of a structure which could help bringing together different stakeholders. So, and now we have the pleasure to announce to you that our recommendation was taken into account. So now in the country level, we have a sort of multi-sectoral platform, which was set up uh, last year in December, according to the recommendation that we, we, we asked to our government for the Minister of Planning. So thank you for your attention. Uh, Landry, thank you very, very much uh, for your intervention, uh, and in particular for joining us uh, from uh, your home country so far away and so late in the day. Um, now, uh, what I would like to do is uh, introduce our final uh, speaker for the day before we start taking uh, questions. Uh, our final speaker is my friend and colleague, David Horan, Assistant Professor at Trinity Business School, Trinity College, Dublin, and advisor on SDG partnerships and governments for the SDGs for Stakeholder Forum. Since 2018, Dr. Horan has been conducting research on data and governance frameworks for the SDGs with a focus on multi-stakeholder partnerships and their role in supporting effective and equitable implementation. David was recently a visiting scholar at Columbia University's Center for Sustainable Development in New York and the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, David, uh, you're very well placed to uh, give us our final presentation for the day. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Charles. Just um, <clears throat> just trying to get my slides in order here. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, just before I start, I'd uh, like to uh, thank all the other speakers for their very interesting uh, presentations, and. <clears throat> I presume you can see my, my slides there, Charles. Yeah, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry now. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so in the short time that we have today, uh, I would like to outline a partnership approach to integrated implementation. Uh, and to demonstrate how this could be, uh, through the use of an example, how this could be applied in practice. And towards the end of the talk, uh, I will then give some reflections on how transnational partnerships and local stakeholder engagement could help operationalize it, particularly uh, in developing world. So the, the question of how to enable integrated approaches is receiving increasing attention uh, at all levels. Uh, linkages are now parts of uh, the thematic reviews at the HLPF. Uh, they're a key team at tomorrow's uh, coordination segment. Uh, the OECD is doing important work on this at national level. And uh, generally, I think we've all seen from the pandemic uh, just how interconnected our world is and how important coordinated policies and responses are for uh, um, for. For, recovering, uh, for recovery and uh, progress on the SDGs. So uh, a lot of work has been done by researchers on developing tools and methods to identify and assess linkages uh, among SDGs. Um, however, it is having limited impact on policy. So for example, uh, many DNRs call for integrated approaches, but very few actually show how governments are using these tools. Um, so today I would like to inst instead focus on a governance approach and the role that stakeholder engagement could play uh, in enabling integrated approaches. Now, uh, the basic idea is to start with a mapping of linkages among SDGs, uh, similar to how uh, Laundry in the previous uh, um, uh, presentation show that these could be developed um, or alternatively uh, taking one from the, the, the scientific literature and to take those mappings and then to build a multi-stakeholder coalition on top of that that can help to manage the, the interactions. So stakeholders here are key because um, uh, for a few reasons, but uh, 
They are key because the linkages are contextual and stakeholders often have intimate knowledge of how these interactions are likely to play out in practice and what solutions could actually work. So the, the, first, the idea here is the first step is to put in place a coalition that roughly uh, or in some sense mirrors the, the linkages that uh, exist. And then the second step then uh, within the context of that partnership to ne negotiate, co-create, coordinate actions uh, and partnerships uh, that can help to deliver an integrated approach. So here, integrated approaches are very much about multi-stakeholder uh, implementation. So today, I just want to focus on the first step, uh, which is how to build multi-stakeholder coalitions or coalitions of stakeholders, uh, uh, which is the first step in, in the, the approach uh, that I propose. Um, it's important to clarify uh, the approach that I, I have in mind for implementation. Uh, or that I am suggesting for implementation. So what we are trying to do is to implement a single goal or target in an integrated way. So this aligns well with uh, a government, national or local, who, are, um, who have a priority SDG uh, that they want to make progress on. The question then is how to do this in an integrated way. Second issue then is what linkages are we considering? So I would suggest that we focus on the main linkages across all of the goals. Um, aligns well with the idea that the SDGs are indivisible and keeping this in mind uh, so here you have if you tackle one uh, goal you're tackling all of them so that's the basic idea of indivisibility and I think that's important for balancing the economic social and and, and environmental di dimensions of, uh, of actions. Third then who are the right uh, partners to bring together? Um, so these are the stakeholders who can help to manage uh, the interlinkages. So those with decision-making power uh, in government or local authorities, and those with knowledge of the linkages uh, and the solutions that could work uh, in the specific context. So it's really uh, <clears throat> that could straddle the, the, the government sector, the business sector, the civil society the sector, and, uh, uh, sector, and the local community sectors as well. Okay, so uh, just on this slide here, to build uh, multi-stakeholder coalitions for integrated implementation of, of the type uh, I have discussed, uh, the paper Framework to Harness Effective Partnerships for the SDGs, uh, uh, which was published, uh, which I published in uh, Sustainability Science, uh, outlines the six-step procedure to follow. And I would propose applying this framework uh, uh, um, basically one stakeholder group at a time. So it's start off with your government ministries and then build outwards to include civil society, business, uh, academia, local communities, or whatever ordering makes uh, most sense. Uh, but the basic idea behind it is uh, if we have uh, good data on linkages, stakeholders and indicators, then we can use the procedure in a relatively straightforward way to develop evidence-based recommendations on who should be in this coalition or who, who should be partnering and in what areas uh, or what issue areas uh, uh, integration is required. Um, so just to, to, to demonstrate, um, I'm going to uh, take an application to Ireland uh, uh, that I, I worked out. And so, and the procedure here can be used to, uh, <clears throat> to develop, what I want to show is that the procedure can be used to develop a proposal uh, for a coalition of government departments uh, to support the integrated implementation of the marine goal uh, and using three types of data. Um, the International Council for Sciences uh, mapping of SDG 14's uh, linkages with uh, all of the other goals. And Ireland's National Implementation Plan, which, can, uh, which uh, helps to identify departments' implementation responsibilities across the goals, and then SDSN's SDG uh, data, which was used to, to select the indicators. So when you have good sources of data like that, um, <clears throat> starting with a, starting with basically <clears throat> a, um, Yes, so just to, to quickly demonstrate how the, the procedure can be used, um, starting with evidence on uh, goal 14's interlinkages with the other SDGs, uh, then you can select indicators that are relevant to those aspects of the goals that are interlinked with SDG 14 and construct a dashboard 
uh, of indicators. And in this case, uh, that dashboard consisted of four marine indicators and 29 uh, linkage in indicators uh, were selected across the SDGs. And and we can use that indicator set to assess the uh, country's baseline as it tries to implement the goal in an integrated way. And here we're just, I'm using simple radar diagrams and traffic light color coding to highlight uh, the challenges that Ireland faces in these interlinked areas as it tries to implement uh, the marine goal uh, in an integrated way. And then using information on the government department's responsibilities, uh, we can uh, sign to each of those indicators, uh, a government department, and bringing it all together, uh, we have here, uh, this can help us then to identify who the lead department uh, for the marine goal needs to work with and in what areas integration is needed. So at that time in Ireland, uh, there was 16 government departments and the framework recommends a coalition consisting of a lead depart marine department uh, the lead marine department working with nine other uh, government departments to manage interlinkages in 15 policy areas. So the idea is that once you have that type of data in place, uh, you can have, uh, or sorry, uh, you can then propose who should be working together. And then uh, once you have a coalition in place, the negotiation of how to coordinate and co-produce uh, actions can, can begin. So that was uh, really just to give you an idea, a rough idea of how the approach could be applied uh, in practice. Now, <clears throat> future research uh, could really develop it uh, in a number of, of different ways, both on the governance side and on the technical side. So uh, not going to go into it in too much detail, but um, on the technical side, uh, issues how we could close uh, data gaps and make the approach feasible in different contexts. Um, how we could uh, improve the accuracy of, how can the accuracy of the recommendations be improved? For example, using more contextual uh, knowledge of linkages, uh, more relevant uh, indicators. Then on the governance side, there's a whole uh, bunch of issues uh, that one could examine, such as how are the, is the priority goal decided? Through what governance process? Um, how is participation in the coalition? Uh, ensured and a balance, a balance of power kept so that everyone's voice is heard and uh, issues are, are best in a co-creative manner. Um, but I think to, to bring that approach to scale, uh, you know, requires teams of researchers uh, uh, working on it. Now, um, just to try and relate it to uh, the moving away from the example of Ireland and thinking about other contexts around the world, um, I think the approach could be especially effective in developing country contexts uh, if it was to, if you were to take a country-led approach. And uh, one way would be to align it uh, uh, with the SDG priorities that are coming out of uh, a national processes, or whether those that are in the national development plans or uh, those that are highlighted through uh, uh, SDG in the DNRs. Um, then uh, transnational partnerships, I think, could play an important role uh, in two ways. First, uh, the UN system working with governments could help to provide tools and capacities to identify, uh, to, to give starting point for applying the framework to identify the interlinkage uh, matrix. So like Laundrie had in the previous uh, uh, slide, and as Professor uh, Raymond Saner was showing uh, 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 examples of networks. So taking the goal that is the priority and then uh, having a tool that shows you the, the different linkages. And uh, it could also support in developing then indicator dashboards that could help the country uh, to, to get an integrated assessment of how it is doing in the interconnected areas and develop that, that dashboard. And the key issue then is uh, who to, how do you identify the stakeholders to bring together into the coalition? And uh, I think supported by the UN system, uh, the government could work with civil society, local authorities and communities uh, uh, and, and many others to try and identify and engage those stakeholders who are, who are key to, to managing the synergies and trade-offs, who have the, the intimate knowledge of how these play out in practice and who have the, the local knowledge of how these solutions uh, could be, uh, of what type of solutions are needed and how uh, other types of solutions uh, need to be adapted to that, to that context. Um, so the, 
I mean, it's not easy to come up with an idea of how to implement an integrated approach. And, uh, you know, this is just one suggestion. And uh, um, uh, I think there's lots of work uh, that could, has to be done with it. But um, I think there's certain uh, uh, promising uh, developments that are occurring at the moment that could really make a, a data approach to the partnership building uh, more, more feasible in the future. So uh, just... Uh, Quickly, uh, one, one example is there's a lot more research being done now on subnational uh, uh, interlinkages. So how national policies are, uh, the effects of national policies are playing out uh, at local levels. And that type of research could be really useful for, for bringing in uh, local communities and uh, making sure that we manage uh, trade-offs from policies uh, effectively and how we adjust policies to ensure that. Uh, a second uh, very promising approach is uh, uses soft systems thinking tools like we saw with Laundry to identify uh, linkages with, with other stakeholders. Um, these, when you do that in a kind of co-creative co process, you're you're also uh, building up uh, relationships between stakeholders that could be used then to to formulate uh, joint actions and partnerships for for, for integrated approach. Uh, a fourth uh, promising trend is the growth of, of open uh, SDG data portals um, that can help with developing in indicator sets and also citizens' data could be used to try and fill uh, data gaps. And then finally, then uh, the increasing availability of uh, geospatial tools like which ESRI and ArcGIS have for, for identifying local stakeholders. So these are just different trends that I think could uh, be brought together to try and uh, enable integrated and um, but that brings me to the end of my presentation. And just to say that those papers are available at uh, open access and, uh, and thank you for your attention. David, thank you very much uh, for that final presentation and for helping us better understand the framework and what's really sort of behind you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts, you might say, of uh, how partnerships evolve and how they operate. Um, so thank you very much for that. Now, what I would like to do is invite all of our panelists to uh, reactivate their mic their cameras for the moment, uh, not your microphones until uh, we ask you to speak. Uh, now, we've, just, we've come to what is meant to be the, the end of the event, which is uh, 45 minutes after the hour. However, uh, if you, uh, our panelists, can stick with us for a few moments, um, I would like to address some of the questions there, and I promise you all that we will wrap up no later than at the top of the hour, because we all have things to do, and Katarina has to get back to the actual partnership forum. Um, so before we go to questions, I want to thank David and Katarina uh, for you know doing the organization, bringing speakers in, because I think if I remember correctly, you, the two of you and young Gustav, uh, you know, were really instrumental in getting this going and for getting the proposal into ECOSOC. Now, um, you all have access to the questions. I'm going to answer one of them because it's a practical one. Uh, it is the one to do with, can we have the webinars report? Well, just so that everyone knows, ECOSOC has asked and requires anyone who they grant a side event to, to provide a summary of how, the, uh, how it went. So our team will be putting a summary together and then we'll share that uh, by email with all those who, uh, who attended today. Now, having said that, um, there are, I think, maybe five questions up there. Some aren't questions per se. Does anyone want to take a stab at one of those questions? In the meantime, I'll go through them. Um, well, the, the first one is to do with convincing indigenous people uh, around the sustainability of accessing precious, precious materials or other natural resources without a planned or proactive alternate livelihood. So I guess the gist of that is indigenous peoples depend on, uh, for many years, on mining uh, and otherwise recovering precious materials. How can that be done sustainably uh, without interrupting or ruining their livelihoods? Would anyone like to take a stab at that? Go ahead, Katerina, please activate your microphone. Thanks. I mean, I, I, I can only say that um, it's very difficult to answer that question. It's going to be very case specific, location specific, community specific. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to answer that question. But I think 
one uh, thing to begin uh, is to have dialogue and ensure a process that that uh, ins that actually considers the the aspects that the these the indigenous population might be concerned with and uh, it's it's there are not unfortunately not very many cases where this has been successful um so because it, it there's there's such hugely competing interests but that's all i can say it's a very general response so that that was helpful i mean in terms of indigenous people even here in the United States, the Native, uh, you know, um, uh, American Indian uh, populations are still struggling to this day with matters related to the sustainability and their traditional livelihoods in what is one of the most prosperous countries in the world. It's still an unsolved problem. Um, let's take a look at some other uh, questions. Um, let's see. Um, well, one of them, uh, it says, which might be a bit difficult, uh, could each panel formulate a practical working plan to implement local, regional, and international uh, partnerships? I think it's a bit of an ambitious question <laughs> to ask our panel. Uh, I think what we will do, though, since there aren't a lot of questions, I would like to give uh, um, each of you a chance to answer, uh, maybe share a few final thoughts. Now, there is um, there's a question in French. Um, uh, are any of our panelists fluent in French? Uh, well, actually, uh, Irena, are you still with us? Um, uh, let's see if our, my colleague Irena Zubsebek is with us. She speaks. Uh, yes, I am. Irena, I don't know. Have any idea what those whether they're statements or a question? Uh, Would you have a look? I, just to give me a sec. Thank you. Uh, I have to get to the questions. Is that a translation? Uh... I tried to do translation, but I couldn't get it to work with Zoom. Uh, uh, Raymond uh, speaks much better French than I do. <laughs> no, no, that. go ahead. Well, <laughs> but I, I'm I think just trying, uh, I'm yeah. just trying to find the question. I'm sorry. I can't see the question uh, I, right I, now. Irena, I see it right in front of me. Basically, Marilo uh, asked, of course, whether everything could be translated or made available in, in, in French. Mm. And she gave some examples why she is interested because she's working uh, uh, with an uh, NGO which wo uh, works on uh, improvements of conditions of AIDS and she is in Gabon. So uh, whether that is possible or not, there's a lot of information. Il y a, il y a beaucoup d'informations qui sont dans ce sens, dans ce sens là, uh, juste de, devant votre porte, si on peut le dire comme ça. Vous pouvez simplement aller um, uh, creuser un peu l'information existe um, au, au site uh, des Nations Unies et ailleurs. Donc, les informations sont là, mais il faut les chercher. On peut vous aider à le faire. I just said, basically, a lot of information exists in French, and it's just a matter of finding the right link. Uh, the UN has quite a lot of information available. As well, of course, I forgot, uh, um, Marilo, il faudrait aussi prendre contact avec um, Landry et Gabende du Congo. Vous <laughs> les deux, vous êtes de langue francophone, donc vous pouvez vous entraider. Et la francophonie peut être aussi avoir des, uh, des choses qui, qui mm -hmm. peuvent être intéressantes. OK. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond and uh, Irena. Uh, for helping out with that. Um, now, would any of you like to take a stab at any of the other questions there? For instance, there's one lacking opinions about ways of thinking about SDG 17. It's not really an objective, but more of a way of achieving all the others with a kind of stake. I might just ask a quick question, uh, just to Demetra, Thomas, and Katerina. Um, you know, given the, the projects you have been involved in underground, uh, and what you've seen there, uh, you know, what uh, Ramon was showing you about uh, the tools that exist to identify linkages and what Laundry was um, uh, explaining about organizing workshops uh, to, to, to help understand them in, in, in different contexts. Uh, do you think 
Could you see how those could be applied, uh, you know, in your current projects or future projects or um, to help, you know, manage the, you know, environmental impacts or strengthen uh, some social benefits you're, you're trying to create uh, in your project? Uh, I'm happy to, to step in there on that, David. I think for us, I mean, Connecting Nature finished in May, so it, it would, you know, it's almost like in hindsight, it would be lovely to go back. I actually found some of Laundry's slides where, where with the um, looking at the different SDGs and how they impacted on the others, it would have been great to go back and uh, do that type of an exercise with some of our cities near the end of the project where they started to really consider the interconnectedness of the environmental, health and well-being, social inclusion, all of the things that nature-based solutions need to be doing at city level um, and really thinking about the trade-offs that, that each of the cities were having to deal with in terms of um, the three phases of uh, MBS implementation. Um, I think uh, it would have been very interesting to kind of go back the baseline at the beginning of the project where we were looking at the strategic alignment and then at the very end, doing a bit of an analysis about how effective they were in, in hitting certain of the of the SDGs would have been quite interesting. Now, I will say just because our project has ended doesn't mean that the nature-based solutions in the cities uh, kind of have stopped. I, I know our cities are very active in finding and seeking additional funding. And um, I would imagine as part of their monitoring and assessment, they would be looking at how how they're how the the NBS in, in in each city is addressing the SDGs but I think that like those slides that that laundry showed were and I wish I had another two two years on the project because <laughs> I would definitely be uh emailing him and seeing how we could uh, imp do some of that work in the cities for sure Demetria thank you uh young Gustav if you have your hand raised would you like to say something Uh, yes, thank you, Charles. Um, and thank you also to to all the comments. Um, David, you mentioned one thing, and I think also Dimitri and, and uh, well, our, all of us mentioned the environmental impact issues. And, uh, and, and uh, having been involved in the environmental issues for so many years, I always feel that environment is something one add on to everything else, uh, because we have to rely on it. And I always think that when you talk about, for instance, as you said, Demetra, the, the definition of nature-based solutions, it stumbles across one thing, and that has to be cost efficient. We don't even know what cost efficiency in environment is, because, you know, if you put that question to, an, uh, to, to private sector, they would say, well, as long as we can make money of it, then it's fine. Well, nature reserves is not supposed to be touched. And they don't make any money in the traditional sense. So the environmental impact, which I think both Thomas and uh, Dimitra and, and Landry also pointed to, and Katerina, uh, is, is, is a riddle we have to, or it's a challenge we have to, to, to get into. And the other element, which I think we all touched upon, which is my concern, because the expertise needed to understand some of the intricacies of the SDGs, including the, the targets, is that it's going to be difficult for a civil society to get into there and make sense if all they do is to think about being a watchdog. We need to have expertise and understanding. As I said, we don't need to be engineers and professors, but we need to know what we're talking about. Otherwise, we're going to be a bit pushed outside. And uh, this is one of the huge challenges that civil society is facing, but not really getting into. Thank you, young Gustav. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of use my executive uh, position here to offer one more comment, because I did promise we were going to wrap up at the end of the hour. So would anyone else like to jump in one more time before we end things? No one's jumping well, up, down? No, maybe briefly. Please. I saw <clears throat> two questions put to us um, by uh, two people asking the question about NGOs whether NGOs should be involved in the implementation, what the role is of NGOs. I would just simply say a government without civil society and without private sector, they're just like on a starship enterprise going out to out of space. They need their citizens for, let's say, the example SDG 6, Oceans, uh, all of all of us and our behavior, <clears throat> which is a lot 
SDG 12. If we <clears throat> don't act sustainably and we throw around these plastic bottles, uh, we're, we're contributing to negatively to uh, the, uh, the SDGs. So the governments has to find a way to find um, constructive, mutually beneficial relations with the NG, uh, with the uh, NGOs and the, and the private sector. However, there should be also understanding, and um, uh, Jan Gustav just alluded to it. NGOs should be there making good substantive contributions wherever that's possible. So if they have an understanding of the SDGs, like being the health sector or food or agriculture, that could be useful. However, the risk is if an NGO group is very smart and shows that they know more than the government, there is a time, depending on the situation at hand, where there is a competition between civil society and the governments. And depending on the governments, they might not be happy to be criticized. So NGOs should equally in that sense, find a role where they can contribute without getting into a political fight with the government because at the end, then everybody is a loser. That's what I'd like just to add. There were these two comments in, uh, in the question box. Thomas, uh, despite what I said earlier, I'll give you the last word. Thank you for that. Uh, I totally agree to what's been said, but I, I also want to add that since we are in dialogue with, with uh, all the sectors, I can see a shift in mindset within the private sector. They are now looking into science-based uh, data and facts, and they are looking into how that can affect their value chains, because in the end, if they don't get their products or their raw materials or their components, from very, very many times from, from low income countries and, and where the most poor and exposed people live, they will only have anything to sell. Mm. So there's, a, there's a value chain and, and a profitable way of, of moving into uh, to sustainable and, and more circular um, uh, business models. And I think that's where we, from the civil society and science and, and also the the, the politicians have to make sure that we have regulations that steer them that way because they will adopt and 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 mitigate into that as well uh, if we do that so in that case i would also like to add that that's why target 17 is all, all most mostly forgotten but is to me it's one of the incremental uh, targets even if it's not a, a super target like the others uh, it's it's so important to have this collaboration uh, and crossover partnership uh, target included in the SDGs. Thomas, thank you for that and for bringing us back to SDG uh, 17, which is, of course, uh, such an important uh, point. Um, well, with that, uh, I will uh, wrap things up now. Uh, I just need to uh, get on to my uh, final words. Um, but I certainly like to thank all of you. Uh, many thanks to our speakers for their contributions, and in particular for your insights, that they've really elevated our understanding of real-world solutions to the global challenges faced by communities around the world, and in particular local communities. Now, uh, in the uh, what I would like to do is to say uh, a big thanks to uh, David and Gustav as earlier, uh, but in particular to our expert panel for delivering uh, today's rich content, thoughtful, uh, and from different time zones around the world. And as I mentioned earlier, the webinar has been recorded. That recording will be posted as a video uh, and as an audio podcast on the Stakeholder Forum website very soon. In fact, you'll get a, uh, a link from the Zoom platform tomorrow that will bring you to the website, which will also have the presentations uh, posted. Uh, in addition, uh, the Stakeholder Forum team, as I said earlier, will be preparing a summary of this for submission to the Partnership Forum Secretariat. Um, on a related note, as you see on your screen, uh, please join us next month for the fourth in Stakeholder Forum series of Countdown to the UN SDG Summit 2023 webinars. We will, we will highlight SDGs 7 and 8, affordable and clean energy, and decent work and economic growth. We'll send out joining instructions soon. And in the spirit of um, uh, Raymond's comment earlier, until next time, live long and prosper. Thank you so much for having me. And take care, everyone. And you take, take care. care. Thank you.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank Bye-bye. you very much. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat>